let me switch on the recording. Yeah. So welcome everybody. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to uh, moderate this session. Um, this session is being held by none other than uh, Professor Alan Siho, who is one of the most renowned speakers around the world in thoracic surgery, the most sought after speaker. There is no conference in the world where, you know, it is complete without Alan speaking. Uh, and I'm very fortunate because I am a very close friend of Alan and uh, we are almost like brothers and we meet each other more often than probably I meet my wife <laughs> we are together on similar meetings uh, across the globe. Uh, Alan has got deep insight into the subject. He's very well read and I'm pretty certain his talk is going to be all evidence based. He is uh, the associate editor. In fact, he's the editor of the uh, thoracic section on the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. So everything that he says is evidence-based. Alan, welcome to this group. Uh, this group is a group of young surgeons uh, from across the world, uh, young and old actually. And they are, uh, some of them are actually exam going. A uh, few of them are doing uh, diplomat of the National Board of Thoracic Surgery. A few of them are doing um, FRCS cardiothoracic surgery. Mm -hmm. And a few of them are doing uh, uh, MCH cardiothoracic surgery. So they are imminently exam going as in within the next few months. Uh, so I would be grateful if you could address these guys particularly and, uh, you know, try and uh, answer some of the questions. Uh, so the floor is all yours, Alan. Uh, uh, take the mic. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, speak to everybody here. Uh, it's uh, especially an honor to, you know, to, to work with my, uh, my good brother, Zamir, again. So let me just see if I can share this screen. Uh, is, is it sharing right now? Yes, it is, Alan. Excellent. Okay. So um, this is a, a subject that's really quite dear to my heart uh, because um, what we're going to be doing right now in conjunction between ATEP representing Asia, uh, EACS, and ESTS in Europe, is that we're doing a conjoint task force looking at the guidelines for um, GGO management internationally. And uh, part of management of GGOs, ground glass capacity lung lesions, is of course a topic of suborbital resection. So really over the last year or two, uh, we've been really looking into this uh, subject uh, a great deal. And really, I just want to share some insights with you. Uh, for all of you who are taking exams, so please be aware that what I'm going to be saying over the next 20 minutes or so is slightly biased. I mean, this is the view of subalbar section from the perspective of a thoracic surgeon. So we are advocates of operating, as you'll see. And so if you are taking exams uh, and uh, what, what you get from the next 20 minutes, it can be used in exams, but please understand that you'll be taking with you uh, a relatively pro-surgery stance. So with that in mind, uh, we are going to jump into uh, some of the evidence, as Amir says. Uh, we won't be talking too much about the technique. That's a subject for a completely different talk altogether. If you want to learn how to do segments, <coughs> there's plenty of opportunities for that. What we're going to be talking about today are some of the myths and reality behind some of the evidence for subalbar section. Now, the the whole idea of really why we're talking about this subject comes from screening, of course. For any patient of lung cancer, the only realistic chance that they have of curing this horrible disease is if we catch it early enough. Nothing we do in surgery, no improvement in surgical technique or uh, any drugs or any radiotherapy is ever going to give you the cure unless you have early stage disease. And thankfully, we have the uh, National Lung Screening Trial published in 2011, which showed the um, uh, uh, improvement in terms of mortality when you give low-dose computed C uh, uh, tomography screening for the first time. And this was followed up uh, in September last year with the publication, well, at least the announcement of the Nelson study results. These two studies between them looked at tens of thousands of uh, lung cancer patients in the West. Uh, these are randomized trials, and both of them have concluded that through screening, you are going to reduce mortality from lung cancer. This is huge, and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more uh, of this uh, lung cancer screening done around the world from now on.
But for me, the most interesting result of all was this. Now, if you look at these, this graph, um, the red and the green uh, bars show you what used to happen. And as we all know, most of lung cancers, when they present, are presenting in stage three and stage four, beyond the reach of us as surgeons. But once you do the screening, you get this blue bar. And suddenly, we're now talking about almost 60% of patients are now stage one lung cancer. So this really, if screening takes hold in, in all parts of the world, what we're going to see is an increase in surgical volumes quite rapidly over the next few years. We're already seeing that to a large extent in Shanghai, in China. Now, one of the upshots of these detections of earlier uh, uh, stage lesions is that you're gonna get a lot of lesions that look like this. So uh, solid, semi-solid, or even pure ground glass opacities, which are small and they look like this. Now, the great thing about these is that you have more options for doing surgery from them. Now, if you look at this, this is the traditional spectrum of surgeries that we as surgeons can offer, ranging from old pneumonectomies and lobectomies to what we now know as sublobar resections. Now, these small lesions and GGOs that we're gonna be detecting on screening are particularly suited for sublobar resections. So when we actually delve into this topic though, there are many myths in the evidence. The first myth, that we come across that everybody has a conception on is that sublobar resection is a poor oncological operation. It's not as good as a lobectomy. Is that true? Let's have a look at the results. Now, a lot of our ideas about the, the poor oncological results come from this one study. This is the very famous lung cancer study group, a randomized trial from 1995. And what they found is that if you compare limited resection, sublobar resection with lobectomy, over long term, you are going to get poor survival. Uh, in particular, you're going to get a lot <coughs> more local residual lobe if you do limited resection. But as many of you already know, this study is badly flawed for many reasons. Poor preoperative staging, uh, uh, inadequate preoperative invasive staging, and also the fact that in those days, limited resection essentially meant uh, and a non anatomical wedge. They did very few, close to no segmentectomies in those days. Results now are slightly different. And especially if we do some of resection, we have to be aware that we're actually doing good for some of our patients because by removing less lung, you're going to better preserve lung function, you're going to reduce morbidity. So there are some <laughs> functional advantages of doing sub resection. Are these enough to overcome those oncological deficits? Now, if we look at the, uh, the patients that we're, we're encountering, these are the patients with really poor uh, risk that really we should be targeting with sublobar resection. These are the compromised patients. Now, if we look at these patients, old, very poor lung function, who are unable to undergo lob uh, lobectomy, these are fairly recent results from Japan. And if you do a sublobar section, and in Japan, we're talking mostly about segmentectomies, <coughs> look at these survival rates. Three-year over survival of almost 80%. Three-year recurrence-free survival of 76%. That is not bad at all. Here's another study from Japan, again, fairly recent. And uh, basically, they looked at, again, high-risk patients, and they split their risk in terms of a, a different uh, individual risk factors. And essentially, if you only have zero or one of these high-risk factors, your recurrence-free survival of three years can go over 90%. I think I'll be able to handle it. Really, what we're seeing is yeah. that if you um, uh, uh, offer surgery to these high-risk patients, you're actually nowadays able to offer a very good survival advantage, better than anything with non-surgical treatment. Now, this is now recognized in the international guidelines. In the ACCP guidelines of 2013, it's now said that in patients with high risk of, of, for surgery, an anatomic sublobar resection, specifically a segmentectomy, is now suggested over a lobectomy. That is the current recognized status of sublobar resection for compromised patients. And again, in the ACCP guidelines, specifically for patients with extreme poor lung function, look at here, with VO2 max of less than 10, now you, they're actually specifically telling you 
to counsel them about VATs, counsel them about sublobar resections. That is the status. Uh, they do mention here non-operative treatment as another option. We'll come back to this in a minute. The, there are some reservations about this. So really, to, to answer the question, is sublobar resection a poor oncological operation? The simple answer is, in the compromised patients, it offers a very uh, decent chance at survival for these patients, especially when compared to non-surgical options. The next question, though, is, is sublobar resection a poor oncological operation outside of these compromised patients? What if your patient is completely normal, like you and me, with good lung function, not too old, you know, they don't have too many comorbidities. Is sublobar resection still a good cancer operation? Now, this is the uh, study done by Dr. Yenda Mori, who many of you already know. Now, this for me is a very important study. Now, what it shows is that back in the old days, yes, there was a separation of the survival curves between lobectomy and sublobar. But as we go through time into the recent years, that difference in survival disappears. Nowadays, with the sublobar resection, you are getting close to lobectomy results. If, I mean, statistically, they're almost, insig uh, almost insignificant when you're dealing with these small lesions. Now, the key to these good results actually lies specifically in patient selection. Now, there are two main things that you need to pay attention to. The first, again, to cut a long story short, is the size of the lesion. Now, there are many studies I could quote. I just picked one meta-analysis, relatively recent, for, just for, for discussion's sake. Now, this particular meta-analysis, you know, quite a bunch of studies, shows that if you look at all stage one lung cancer patients and you compare a sublobar with lobar resection, lobar resection still edge it. It's still better to do lobectomy rather than segmentectomy. But if you look specifically at stage 1A patients, i.e. the tumor of two centimeters or smaller, that statistical significance disappears. So the first and key selection criteria is you want to find tumors that are two centimeter or smaller in diameter. The second key criteria is selecting GGO or non-solid or semi-solid lesions. Because if you have these GGOs, and I think we all know what we mean by GGOs, and if they're pure or mostly GGOs, look at the survival rates for these patients. We're talking about, you know, five-year uh, uh, overall survival, disease-free survival of almost 100%. If you do sublobar sections for these patients, you're getting incredibly good uh, uh, survival. Now, how can we actually define uh, GGOs? Now, one of the ways to do it, uh, the popular way of doing it, is the CT ratio, the consolidation to ratio. So if you have a lesion, and most of it is mainly consolidation rather than tumor, this is a significant prognostic indicator suggesting that really you can offer segmentectomy to these patients. So size and solidity of the lesion are the two key selection criteria. The other thing you have to consider when you uh, offer uh, sublobar sections is what sublobar section you are actually offering. Again, there are many papers like this one. I'm just choosing this one as an example. Now, this, these studies consistently show that if you do segmentectomy, you are going to have better results than just a wedge resection. And this uh, relates to overall survival as well as to recurrence. And there are many studies like this. Now, the question is though, why is it that when you offer segmentectomy, you get these better results. What is special about dissecting the veins, artery, and bronchus individually rather than just stapling the whole ruddy thing? Now, it turns out that it may well be simply a matter of margins. If you do a segmentectomy rather than a wedge, the chances of you getting a good adequate margin of over one centimeter is significantly better with a segmentectomy. And if you do have a good margin, then your local recurrence rates also significantly drops. So nowadays, the guidelines recognize this, and they always uh, uh, note that segmentectomy is preferred. What we don't know is in future whether we can prove that if you get a good enough margin with just a wedge, are you still getting the same kind of survival as with the segmentectomy? That's something we don't know yet. So 
again, now, now, uh, there's another factor that we also need to take into account if we are going to have good results of subval dissections, and that's lymph node dissection. Now, the myth is that, well, these lesions are GGOs or semi solid lesions. You don't need to do a lymph node dissection. And you hear this said over and over again by many surgeons around the world. Is there any truth behind this? Well, if you actually look at the, some of the recent studies, this was done by uh, Al Twerke's group in New York, you'll find that if you don't assess the lymph nodes, you're potentially missing metastatic lymph nodes, N1 or N2 mets, in up to 4.3% of patients. Now, translated into survival, this is what you see. In terms of uh, uh, survival curves, there is a separation. Now, this group only did wedge resections for clinical stage 1A lung cancer. If you do a lymph node assessment, you get significantly better survival, both overall and disease-free. Now, uh, I think the main reason for this is probably more accurate staging. So when we actually say uh, stage 1A, the lymph node assessment gives you a better uh, stage-specific survival. But nonetheless, there is an importance of doing the lymph node uh, dissection. There are more studies that showed exactly the same thing. This is from the Tommy D'Amico's group in Duke. Again, you see a separation of survival curves if you do or do not do the lymph node sampling. Here's a study from Korea. Again, you see a, 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 a little bit of a survival curve difference. But the most important thing here is that they also found that the more lymph nodes you take, the better your chance of having a recurrence-free survival. So lymph nodes do make a difference. And last but not least, this is a study, an earlier study done from uh, Harvard that uh, showed that if you do sublobar section without lymph nodes, there is a significant separation of the survival curves from a lobectomy. But if you do the sublobar section with the lymph node sampling, the difference in survival curves is no longer statistically significant. So if sublobar plus lymph node sampling for these small lung cancers, you get almost equivalent survival to a lobectomy. So that's another key factor. So what have we said all, uh, all along up to this point is that with good patient selection and with good surgical selection, sublobar section, you're getting close to uh, lobectomy results. <coughs> so that's fine, but that's not the key comparison we need to make. Moving forwards, when we're dealing with these small lesions and GGOs, this is the comparison that's important. Because for the patient presenting with lesions that look like this, their, their, uh, uh, their, their uh, decision is not between lobectomy and wedge resection. They're <coughs> trying to make up their minds whether to have surgery or whether to have SBRT. And SBRT, if I was a patient, that would look very, very attractive. No incisions, no cuts, just having a few uh, beans zapped into you and potentially you're getting just as good cure. Who would want that? So the myth now is SBRT can give you equal survival as surgery, as civil resection. If this myth is true, of course we would go for SBRT. Now, where does this myth come, come about? Well, you get a lot of uh, oncological studies like this. Now, this is the famous one. This is the Joe Chang study in Lancet Oncology in 2015. They compared SBRT not with civil resection. They compared it with lobectomy. And look at this. This blue line is SBRT or SABER. It's actually better than surgery. My goodness, you have SBRT. It's even better than having a lobectomy. Who in their right no. mind would want sublobar resection anymore? Now, this caused a great stir back in 2015. But since then, we've realized that this study was complete garbage. There are so many faults to this study, I can't even begin to list them all. We don't have time to list them all. But all I can say is that this study is barely worth the paper it's printed on. Lancet Oncology printed this paper because they knew it would cause controversy and would generate a lot of citations. And it certainly did. But it's flawed science. Now, if you actually look at many other studies, maybe not so glamorous, you will find that surgery still gives you an edge. This is a study comparing SBRT with just normal wedge resections. We're not even talking about segmentectomies. And you see surgery still does better. Now, this is a small study. So let's put it to one side. Let's look at some systematic reviews. Now, this was done by uh, a bunch of, you know, fairly respectable surgeons and, and physicians. Now, they looked at compromised subalbar resection. 
So you're looking at overall five-year survival rates. Yeah, you know, they're reasonable. Remember, these are still compromised patients who can't tolerate a, a, a low bar resection. And this is the local recurrence rate. Now let's have a look at the results for SPRT in the same systematic review. And if you look at these numbers, well, they don't look that different from, from sub-lobar resection, do they? We're still talking about 60 to 80% survival. But look closely. Look at this first row. That's two-year overall survival. Let's go back to the earlier slide. In, in the earlier slide, with compromised sub-lobar resection, we're talking about five-year overall survival. If you only look at two-year overall survival of the SPRT, you're getting the same figures as the five-year overall survival with surgery. And this is actually replicated in many other studies. Now, this is actually a study that was published in JAMA Surgery in 2014. Now, this is interesting. The, uh, the, this uh, thicker gray line actually is SPRT. The thinner black line is lobectomy. And what you see is early on, actually, you get better results with SBRT. But over time, the lines cross, okay? And towards the end, actually, <coughs> it's not significant. But on a breakdown of the results, this is what they actually found. You actually get a, a, a better survival with SBRT in the first six months, simply because you have surgery, you have a little bit of mortality risk there. But after the first six months, Survival is significantly better with surgery. So it's time dependent. Survival really depends on how long you follow these patients. Here's another systematic review published in the ICVTS. Now, again, to cut a long story short, they found exactly the same thing. At one year, the overall survival was similar between the two groups. But if you follow up these patients for up to three years, you will see the benefit, the superiority of surgery over SBRT. It's a matter of how long you follow up these patients. And uh, many studies since then have shown this uh, quite convincingly. This is a study looking at the National Cancer Database. Look at this, over 100,000 patients. And when you have that many patients, not those crappy Joe Chang's uh, studies of only a, a few dozen patients, when you have over 100,000 patients, this is a separation of survival curves you get. Surgery is consistently better than SBRT, sublobar surgery. Here's another one using the SEER database in older patients. And again, you see the same separation of survival curves. Uh, I, I forgot to put in the labels here, but you can easily tell the red is the surgery. It's better than the uh, SBRT. And last but not least, this is a relatively recent study using the uh, Veterans Administration database. And again, you see that uh, this is the risk of cancer death is significantly higher on follow-up with SBRT. So there's no question that surgery, if you look at all the accumulated uh, uh, patient statistics over the years, consistently outperforms SBRT. Now, you'll still say that, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe SBRT is a little bit less good than surgery. But, oh, wait a minute, it still causes less harm than surgery, doesn't it? Because there's no cut, there's no resection involved. Now, this, I can tell you, is also a myth, okay? Now, this is a typical uh, uh, paper that's quoted often by oncologists. Again, I use this just as an example, okay? There are many other papers like this. Now, what these guys uh, first say is that, whoa, the uh, two-year survival is similar between SBRT and surgery. Notice two-year survival. If these guys had followed it up for longer, for three years, four years, five years, who knows, maybe we'll see surgery better. But anyway, they just look at two years. They say it's similar. But despite similar survival, they still say SVRT is better. Why? Because they say there is far less morbidity than surgery if you do SVRT. Now, they say this like it's a fact, but there is no result here, no result here that validates this conclusion. And yet this myth that SVRT causes far less morbidity than surgery is almost taken for granted by many of our oncology friends. Is this actually valid? And I would say, look, look at here. This is SBRT. This is surgery. We can do a subtle resection with just one tiny little wound like this. Patient goes home in less than 48 hours, sometimes even less than 24 hours. This is what happens when you have SBRT for a similar lesion. There's your SBRT. Three months later, you still get a bit of shadow. 
But if you follow up these patients long enough, this is the image you get. This is permanent fibrosis. This is actually damage to the lung even by doing SBRT. And somewhere along the line, this kind of change will have functional consequences for patients. And this is where it shows. Now, this is a, a very often quoted uh, 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 paper. Uh, a lot of people use this to say that, oh, after treatment of SBRT, uh, the functional uh, uh, capacity of these patients in terms of FEV1 and uh, DLCO, uh, it's better than SBRT compared to surgery. But what they don't show you in this graph, with surgery, after treatment, there's no difference in the, in the lung function. With SBRT, there is a bit of a drop. Now, if you actually look at the actual data in this study, it gets even more interesting because it's actually shown that, you know, when they compare these patients, they're not entirely comparable. In fact, the patients in the surgical groups probably have worse disease and have more preoperative comorbidity than the SBRT patients. The surgery patients are worse off than the uh, uh, SBRT patients pre-treatment. And yet despite this, after treatment, the surgery group had no more adverse events. They had no more morbidity or complications than the SBRT group. So surgery did not cause more morbidity than SBRT. Uh, Tommy D'Amico wrote a commentary on that paper, and he listed a lot of problems uh, if you, uh, with the paper that actually favored SBRT unfairly. But one point I think he made that was very interesting is this first thing. Very often when we consider SBRT morbidity, we just consider the radiation to the lung itself. And that, as I said, is already significant. But what we fail to consider is that SBRT shouldn't be alone. SBRT always or should be combined with biopsy. You shouldn't be doing SBRT unless you do biopsy. Surgery, you just go ahead and do it. So if you are considering the SBRT management pathway, you need to consider the biopsy-related morbidity as well. And biopsy, as we know, consists of things like this, bronchoscopy, FNAC, ENV, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's take FNAC. This is probably one of the most common uh, approaches nowadays. This uh, F, uh, FNA uh, biopsy for these patients of GGOs, first of all, it's not that accurate. If you have a pure GGO, the sensitivity is only 50%. It's like tossing a coin, and yet you still need to do this before you embark on SBRT. So this is a pretty dodgy uh, uh, investigation to begin with in terms of accuracy. And yet despite this uh, diagnostic yield that's pretty crap, if you actually, sorry, excuse my French, but despite this, look at the morbidity that you're causing. Look at just one complication, pneumothorax. Typically after an FNA for one of these GGO lesions, almost a third of your patients will have pneumothorax with a substantial proportion of them actually needing a chest tube placement. Now compare this with modern surgery for GGOs, these small little incisions. How often do we need a post-intervention uh, re-intervention, i.e. putting in another chest strain after surgery? It's next to negligible. There is no 30-day mortality typically. There is hardly any uh, major complications. No patient in this particular series had uh, air leaks. And in return, your accuracy of a surgical biopsy is almost always 100%. So why are we still uh, hesitant to use surgery? Why are we uh, uh, conceding the argument to our oncologists and saying that, oh yeah, surgery probably causes morb morbidity? I don't agree with that. I don't think in this day and age with modern surgery done by proper VAT techniques that we are causing any more harm to our patients than SBRT. And certainly surgery has advantages in terms of diagnosis, in terms of instant treatment. So really, we as surgeons really need to be standing our ground a bit firmer when we have our discussions with our oncology colleagues. So just to wrap everything up, I think uh, this is uh, the conclusion. I think uh, there's a myth about uh, sublobar surgery being inferior. It actually isn't. In selected patients, not all patients, but in carefully selected patients, sublobar surgery is a very effective cancer operation. Uh, there is a myth that sometimes uh, things like lymph node dissection doesn't matter. 
I think it does matter. I think it's always safer and not that much more difficult to do a lymph node dissection when you do subliver sections. There is a myth that SBRT gives you equal or better survival than subliver section. That's complete garbage. If you actually look at the available evidence, subliver surgery, at least as of today, still gives you better survival than SBRT. In future, who knows? But as of today, subliver section still consistently gives you better survival. And last but not least, there's a myth that SBRT causes less morbidity. It doesn't. Subliver surgery doesn't cause more harm than SBRT, uh, and we as surgeons really need to stand our ground on this point. Thank you very much. Excellent, Alan. That is just one of the most comprehensive reviews I have come across uh, uh, talking about surgery versus SBRT and sublobar resections. Thank you very much for that, Alan. You're very kind. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, get everybody back on, and I will uh, start off by asking a few questions just to clarify a few things for the students. Um, uh, number one is that I'm going to re I have recorded this presentation, and I would recommend all the students to go back and read the paper. So see the video again and make down notes because I think uh, during the presentation, you might not have recorded the various uh, papers that he was quoting. So don't worry about it. I will put it up on, on YouTube and other uh, channels so that you can actually get each of those papers out. Now, Alan, a couple of questions that I, I had to start off with. Uh, some of them may be technical questions, but I just want to highlight it since we are all online together. Uh, what would you accurately define as a sublobar resection in terms of surgical technique? What, what constitutes a sublobar resection? What is the least amount of structures that you have to at least take to call it a sublobar resection versus a wedge resection? Well, uh... I think subliver section really technically is anything if you're taking less than a lobe. So that would include all manners of wedge resections and all manners of segmentectomies, technically speaking. Um, I think uh, uh, what we've shown uh, pre in, in within this uh, presentation is that if you do an anatomical segmentectomy, it tends to give you better results than a wedge resection. A lot of that, as I said, uh, probably has to do with uh, uh, achieving good margins. By doing a segmentectomy, by actually going into the uh, segmental level uh, vessels and bronchi and doing that dissection, what you're doing uh, indirectly or subconsciously is that you actually are achieving a finer, a deeper dissection rather than just a lazy wedge. And that probably accounts for the better results. Now, I, I, uh, what I have been saying to a lot of colleagues though, is that the flip side of that same coin is that, okay, if I do a wedge resection, but I can somehow find a way of getting just as good margins as a segmentectomy, i.e. a wide wedge resection, will that give me equally good uh, uh, survival outcomes as a segmentectomy? Now, that is something I don't think we have the answer to at the moment. And none of the upcoming uh, studies being done in America and Japan, I don't think are properly uh, designed to address this question. Uh, okay, but no, my question is more directed towards anatomical segmentectomy. So do we have to take the bronchus of the segment, the artery of the segment, and the vein of the segment for us to call it a segmentectomy? Or yes. can we take the bronchus and the artery and then find a wedge which would include the vein? Yes. Uh, find uh, the, so the question absolutely. is... What is the definition of a segmentectomy? Segmentectomy. Um, now, I, I used, uh, ver uh, I don't know, a few years ago, I would sometimes be lazy and I would do that. I would just do the artery and the bronchus. And then sometimes if I have difficulty with the vein, I say, what the hell, we will just uh, staple it without dissecting the vein out. However, I think uh, now speaking to a lot of uh, colleagues around the world, I've changed my attitude. And I think I would make every effort to take the segmental vein out. Uh, as well. And there's an anatomical reason for that. Because as you know, um, anatomically, uh, segments are defined by the, uh, by, by the pulmonary veins. The, uh, the, the, the segmental level pulmonary veins actually flow along the intersegmental planes. Oh. So if you actually dissect 
the uh, veins out uh, carefully. And when you actually do the final stapling of the intersegmental planes, and you can actually see the uh, distal stumps of the veins, you actually are ensuring that you get an adequate uh, 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 segment removal. Whereas if you skip that last part some, and you just, just wedge it out with the veins, sometimes you're actually uh, compromising on the margins a little bit. Now, this is a view that uh, I've gathered from just talking to a lot of uh, so-called experts around the world. Is there actually any good data for that? Uh, no, there isn't. I don't think anybody's actually done a specific study on the effect of just doing the veins. But I think it's a, it's a general consensus among uh, many colleagues around the world now. Uh, I have specifically heard you speak about the oncological benefit of taking the vein uh, in terms of uh, the oncogenes and things like that. Uh, I remember from one of your lectures, you, was, you were talking about <laughs> which to take first and things like that. Can you, can you bring up that conversation again? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. Now, um, what, what has been shown in some very elegant studies, uh, mainly from Japan, is that when we do a lobectomy, not a segmentomy, when we do a lobectomy, uh, some people like to do the artery first, some people like to do the vein first. And what these Japanese studies have shown is that if you do the vein first in your lobectomy, you actually get less seeding of the tumor cells into the systemic circulation because there's no vein. So you, you do that first, you actually get potentially less spread of the cancer into the systemic circulation, which might lead to future mets and recurrence. Uh, uh, again, uh, there haven't been enough studies to show that that translates directly into better survival yet. But I think there's a general feeling amongst some thoracic surgeons that maybe taking a vein out is theoretically oncologically better. In the context of a segmentectomy, however, as, as all of us know, it's not that easy to do the vein first. In fact, in most cases, it's easier to do the, the artery first in many cases, as you allude to. So um, uh, for segmentectomies particular, particularly, I, uh, I don't think there's any evidence to say that doing the vein or artery first has, makes any difference. I think technically it's very difficult to actually do a study like that because simply, uh, I, at least my own skill levels aren't good enough to l allow me to dictate which uh, vessel I do first when I do a segmentectomy. Yeah. So you just take whatever comes your way first yeah, the segmentectomy. to make it anatomically possible to do a segmentectomy. Yeah. Now, when you do your cases where you are doing a segmentectomy uh, for a ground glass opacity, do you always prefer to get a CT guided biopsy first or do you do a frozen section on table? Uh, that, that's a very, very good question. Um, I, I, uh, I think it really depends on how much you trust your uh, pathologist, doesn't it? I think if you have great pathologists that can tell you exactly, you know, uh, not only whether this is a neoplasm or not, but whether it's an AAH or a MIS or a AIS or a MIA or invasive adenocarcinoma on a pre-op FNA, then yeah, maybe you, you should go with that. But I can tell you that in most hospitals that I work in, the, um, the, uh, the specificity of their diagnoses from a small volume biopsy is usually not good enough. Not only that, they're probably, uh, they can't even give you a, a good diagnosis on frozen section. So I don't tend to uh, uh, always uh, specify necessarily uh, a pre-op uh, uh, biopsy. In fact, if anything, I think with surgery, we can probably combine the things, diagnosis and uh, curative dissection in the same sitting. What I do insist on, though, rather than just biopsy, is that all these uh, small lesions and GGO lesions need to go through an MDT tumor board meeting. I think uh, uh, we need a consensus amongst the tumor board that this lesion looks like, a, looks like a possible cancer, it smells like a possible cancer, it's a possible cancer. And that is usually the threshold uh, uh, we use uh, to determine whether or not we bring the patient to the OR. Uh, do you do a frozen section on table? Or uh, uh, how often have you missed a lesion? You've done uh, the surgery, uh -huh. but the histology came back as did not find the lesion. <laughs> well, that's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Yes, it, it, it does happen. Um, I, I, uh, 
again, whether or not we do the frozen section to confirm that, that depends on uh, uh, the pathologist in a particular hospital and how much uh, our uh, confidence is uh, with, with each other. And if, it, if it's very reliable uh, pathological service, yeah, we, we, sometimes, we tend to do the frozen section. Now, whether we, we, we uh, have uh, missing lesions, that's a different uh, situation. Uh, altogether, and uh, there are different ways of tackling that. As you know, a lot of people uh, uh, rely on preoperative localization, whether you use uh, methylene blue or hook wire, whether you place the marker uh, endobronchially or percutaneously. There are different variations, and uh, to a large extent, it, again, it also depends on individual uh, experience at individual hospitals. If you have a very good uh, interventional radiologist, like we do in Shanghai, for example we tend to be more liberal with our use of CT-guided uh, hook wire placement. Whereas uh, where I also work in Shenzhen, our uh, intervention radiologists sometimes are not so reliable. We tend not to go down that pathway with our cases in Shenzhen. Now, what we have been doing a, 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 a lot more is we've re been relying on um, uh, preoperative uh, CD, uh, CT uh, reconstructions in the more... Uh, uh, sort of borderline cases. These are cases that we think maybe we can't palpate, palpate it during surgery. So if we can actually have an MDT meeting with our radiologists before uh, surgery, we actually get them to, to more or less specify exactly which anatomical segment this lesion is, then we can just go in and just take that anatomical uh, segment out with a, you know, a fair confidence that uh, uh, the lesion, whether it's palpable or not, will be in that segment. So that's what we're relying uh, on a lot nowadays. In Shenzhen, we're now purchasing uh, the Japanese Valmap system, which is essentially a, a bit more sophisticated software to help us do the uh, 3D reconstructions from the DICOM data to help us localize lesions. And uh, sometimes we go by that rather than actually putting a marker in the lesion itself. Uh, okay, Alan, before I ask the next question, would you stop sharing your screen so we can oh sorry sorry okay. yeah. oh, if you yeah. stop sorry. sharing your screen we can add okay. Okay. Yes. so um, I, I was actually going to ask you my next question was that nowadays most of us are doing these surgeries by vats or by robotics uh, and uh, really ggos to feel and palpate with your finger is a whole new ball game altogether so what are the techniques available? I, I know you've just mentioned a few, but just for the benefit of the students, what are the techniques available for localizing the GGO to help facilitate resection during surgery? Okay, I think if we, uh, for exam purposes, I think we, we uh, go, go by textbooks. The, the simplest method is always the surgeon's finger. And I think we have to make the point that uh, I think in the vast majority of cases, with an experienced surgeon, your finger is probably the most sensitive instrument. And uh, with, uh, with semi-solid lesions down to one millimeter, as palpated before. Now, in the cases that you think that uh, are borderline or maybe uh, probably impalpable, then you need some sort of pre-op localization. And the usual um, uh, uh, criteria for judging whether it's uh, difficult to palpate is if the uh, depth of the lesion away from the lung surface is equal to or greater than the diameter of the lesion itself, or if the lesion is predominantly or entirely GGO, then these are the ones that you have trouble with. Now with these uh, uh, cases, the options are either a placement of a preoperative marker, uh, so as I said, you can place it either using a bronchoscopic uh, uh, approach, especially with the uh, electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy systems nowadays, or with a percutaneous approach using CT or other forms of uh, guidance to place a marker. The actual marker you place can be, the common ones are either a dye, usually methylene blue, or a hook wire, or nowadays we're, we're, looking, uh, we're seeing things like fiducials. Now I know that Hiroshi Date's unit in Japan are putting uh, radio frequency identif uh, identification tags. This can be used. Uh, some of our European colleagues are uh, injecting with Heidel or some sort of uh, expanding substance. So actually it causes the lesion to be uh, so-called palpable during surgery. So you can put in the markers. The last option that I mentioned just now, which I tend to, to like a lot, is simply to do away with that, 
all that, just use a good mapping system preoperatively. You can see on, uh, on the CT uh, 3D mapping exactly which anatomical segment that lesion is in and how far away from the intersegmental planes that lesion is in. You know that, you just go into surgery and just take that specific segment out and you are fairly confident that uh, the lesion will be removed. So there are various options. Okay, so there are various options. Now, coming back, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sort of focusing on the surgical side of things no a little problem. because these guys need to know that. Uh, they will go through all of the literature uh, when I put this up on the, on the internet. But I, 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 I want to ask you, in terms of lymph node dissection, you, you, you spoke, uh, you, you did mention that we should do lymph node dissection. Yes. What is the benefit of sampling versus systematic nodal dissection in a segmentectomy I'm talking about? Okay. Sampling versus systematic nodal dissection versus stage specific, as in if it is in the upper lobe, just do the, you know, two, four, and seven. So Great. is there any evidence out there which is telling us that one is better than the other or should we do, you know, cherry picking and just get off? <laughs> What is the that, best? That, 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 that's a great, great question. And uh, thank you for that question because it allows me to elaborate on a point that I didn't really go into much in, in the talk. Now, first of all, should we be doing uh, any sort of lymph node dissection, either sampling or dissection in the first place? Now, the argument against it is that uh, a lot of these lesions are uh, uh, AAH or they're uh, MIA or the AIS. So by definition, if they are not invasive, there's no way they can spread to the lymph nodes. So if you know the pathology is not invasive adenocarcinoma, then there's no reason to do any lymph node dissection whatsoever. You don't even need to remove a single lymph node. Now, the problem with that is, well, as again alluding to earlier, is the reliability of your intraoperative frozen section. Now, if your pathologist can tell you on frozen section that this is definitely MIA, it's definitely not invasive adenocarcinoma, yeah, sure, don't do any lymph node dissection. There's no point. But the problem is in many hospitals, as I'm sure you're very well experienced with, the radiologists don't necessarily uh, have the capacity to make that differentiation. They can tell you it's a cancer or it's uh, a tumor, and that's about it. And in this sort of situation, do you do the lymph node dissection or not? Now, overall, I think what we showed just now in those few slides I had is that overall, there's a, 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 a balance of evidence suggesting that you should do the lymph node dissection if in doubt. Because if you don't, you are going to have uh, poor uh, staging and uh, poor survival. Now, your question about whether we should be doing sampling or whether we should be doing a, a, a full uh, a systematic dissection, I don't think it actually has been well addressed. The only um, uh, sort of evidence that we've had so far is some of the Japanese studies that kind of say that, oh, if, if this lesion is in a certain place in the lobe and you do a segmentectomy, the chances of nodal spread are higher or lower. Um, if students are interested, they can go into some of these studies. There are a few of them available, but they're relatively small studies uh, and uh, uh, the level of evidence is not extremely high. So overall, at the moment, I don't think there's enough concrete evidence to really point us to, towards doing a, a, a limited or more extensive dissection. There's no evidence to say whether we should be doing a lobe or, or a segment-specific dissection when doing a subulbar uh, resection. What do the guidelines say? Guidelines? They don't say anything. <laughs> the, the guidelines, uh, as, as you know, Zemir, they, they, they are awful uh, in, in this respect. The guidelines, uh, they, they're, let's, let's take the NCCN guidelines, for example. You have one set of guidelines for confirmed uh, non-small cell lung cancer. The role of surgery in these small lesions is really relegated to quite a, a small part, and they don't tell you exactly what you need to do. If you're looking at the NCCN screening guidelines, they're similarly vague. If these lesions persist, they just say, you know, take it out or biopsy. 
if they take it out, i.e. surgery, they don't even specify what kind of resection you should be doing, let alone what kind of lymph node resection you're doing. So you're absolutely right. I think the guidelines are failing us as surgeons, and that is precisely why I think uh, uh, through ATEP, EAX, and ESDS, we are we have a need to develop new guidelines specifically for surgeons. Okay, now your decision for segmentectomy, you said is decided by two things. Uh, one is the size of the lesion, which yeah. you said should be less than two centimeters, and also the solidity of the lesion uh, on the CT uh, staging. Uh, what about the presence of a peripheral versus a central uh, GGO? Does that change your strategy of management? Does that change your decision of what surgery would you do? Oh, absolutely. I, I th um, obviously, uh, you have to go past those uh, initial two criteria, size and solidity first. Once you have that, and then you see a, a peripheral lesion, no question, it's sublobar. If it's a central lesion, then I think uh, it's hard to generalize. It really depends on the uh, experience of the individual surgeon. There are some surgeons who are extremely skilled at doing uh, the more complex lower lobe uh, uh, segmentectomies. There are some surgeons who do sub-segmentectomies, so they can actually get the, uh, the re required uh, uh, margins uh, for these uh, deep lesions. Not everybody is that skilled. I'm not very good at the sub-segmentectomies myself, so um, it's, it's hard to generalize. If you can't uh, do that surgery, I don't think really we should be pressing for it just for the sake of doing a sublobar section. I think if it's a difficult lesion and uh, the patient can tolerate it, there's no harm in, uh, well, no real harm in doing a lobectomy for these patients as long as you treat the lesion. Patients, um, I'm sure you agree, won't thank you for the fact that you've done a sublobar section. They thank you for, the, for curing their cancer. Of course. Now, very often you see a patient with a solid lesion in one lobe and a GGO in another. And so does that mean you would do a lobectomy and a segmentectomy in the other one? Or, or how do you deal with this sort of scenario? Wow, a very good question. And it's a, certainly a very real uh, uh, situation we face very often nowadays with increasing screening. We've had a lot of experience of these cases. And uh, really, we, we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, not patient-by-patient, patient, but an each lesion-by-lesion. Lesion. So if a patient has two lesions on, in two lungs, we actually individually consider them whether this leads a lobectomy, whether it leads a sublobar section. And uh, if, we, if, uh, if, if it just so happens that they need a sublobar section on both sides, then we just go ahead and do it. If they need a lobectomy on both sides, again, if the patient can tolerate, we just do that. So it's lesion-by-lesion. Okay. Lesion. okay. And, and what if they are present on two lungs, as in one on the right side, one on the left side, would you address both at the same time or would you do a staged procedure? Wow, that's again, highly controversial. You're asking some excellent questions here. Uh, I think in general, I think, uh, um, uh, I've, I've, I've spoken to quite a few uh, colleagues. In fact, I just visited Bob Cervolio in New York and his team, I think we, we also discussed this, this thing. There's a general consensus, I think, uh, uh, that uh, it should be staged. I think uh, the, the uh, morbidity of having wounds on both sides of the chest is probably greater than the sum of the parts. So uh, it's probably safer to do it when, uh, stage. However, in selected patients, uh, I've certainly done quite a few simultaneous bilateral uh, surgery before. And if it's a good risk patient, uh, you, you know that they have good rehab potential. I don't think there's any problem uh, if you're careful in, in doing a simultaneous surgery as well. So I think uh, it really depends on uh, your surgical uh, experience and also the team around you. Okay, with the Guangzhou team and the other Chinese surgeons coming up with the uh, sub xephoid axis, uh, do you think yes. sub xephoid gives you access to both the lungs and can you safely do a segmentectomy on both sides? Uh, yes. Uh, in theory, that's the advantage. And uh, we've certainly uh, seen a lot of that from our Shanghai colleagues, from our Taiwan colleagues. Um, the only um, uh, counter argument to that is that if you do a sub siphoid approach, you sacrifice the ability to palpate the lung. You can palpate certain parts of the lower lobes, 
but certainly nobody's finger really should be long enough to reach all the way to the top of the lung, and certainly can reach to the back of the lung with a finger. So if you are considering doing subxiphoid bilateral surgery, I think you really do need to invest in a preoperative localization to a much greater degree. Is there any role for using a ultrasound probe intraoperatively to help you identify the lesion? Absolutely. Uh, I, th I think there are many options. Uh, interest in, uh, ultrasonography uh, is, is one thing that we have tried in Hong Kong. I think our results are a bit iffy because as you know, ultrasound is very user dependent. There are other alternatives. I mentioned the Hiroshi Dante, they're working on a radio frequency identification tag, but the most uh, 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 popular option uh, that people are talking about nowadays, of course, is in designing green fluorescence. And uh, because you're a robotic surgeon and you have Firefly, that's even better for you. <laughs> okay, so I, I think ICG is, 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 is fantastic if you can afford it and it's available in, in, in your unit. Okay. Uh, and one more, one last question for me is that we, uh, the surgeons in the Asian uh, uh, side of the world, particularly in the Southeast Asian side of the world, we have uh, a lot of TV. Oh, yes. Uh, in our patients. And ground glass opacities is a nightmare for us because you don't know whether you're dealing with cancer or whether it's a TB. So what, what's your opinion on these sort of scenarios? What, what do you think, uh, you know, are the troubles that we face in this sort of situation? You're, you're absolutely right. I, th I think GGOs, the same uh, appearing, you know, lesion, whether it's in Europe or in uh, 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 South Asia or whether it's in East Asia, can mean very, very different things. Uh, certainly in East Asia, and we're talking about China, Japan, Korea, we have a very, we have relatively low threshold for operating on these patients because our experience is in uh, an Oriental population, if we do these operations, a lot of them come back as cancer or precancerous. In Europe, most of them are benign and they just leave it alone and that's fair enough. And it's certainly, as you say, in, in, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, it's a lot TB. So that's exactly why I said earlier that uh, my recommendation is, is of these lesions is that they must go through an MDT tumor board. Because as a Chinese surgeon, I don't have the experience to advise an Indian surgeon on their GGOs in, their, in that country. I think it really depends on the radiologists, uh, uh, pulmonologists, oncologists in your own country uh, to, to tell you how likely it is to be a cancer. And that's why I think MDT management is essential to GGO management. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alan. I'm now going to throw the room open. I'm sorry I asked you a lot of <laughs> oh, no, no. Questions. Great questions for the audience because I know exactly what's running through their minds. So I want to <laughs> highlight some of those points. Now I'm going to throw the session open to our participants and anybody who wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself uh, for on the microphone icon, which is at the left-hand base. And then I introduce yourself and then ask a question. Take your time, go slow and ask the question and then we'll try and answer this. I won't bite. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's... Hi. Yes, uh, Shashikaran, tell us. Yes, yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is uh, Shashikiran from uh, AIMS. Uh, sir, uh, is there a role for uh, endobronchial ultrasound in uh, uh, quantifying in qualifying these uh, GGOs into whether they're malignant to see whether the uh, we you told about uh, consistency based on CT. Is there a role for uh, EBUS guided biopsy or uh, EBUS guided uh, imaging of this? Yes, always, always. Uh, there's always a role uh, uh, for any diagnostic modality. But I think the point I was making earlier is that uh, uh, with, with technology like EBIS, it's very um, dependent on the individual uh, unit and the individual clinician doing it. How uh, capable are you of achieving a, a reliable diagnosis of these uh, uh, techniques? If it's not very reliable, and uh, if, if you can actually with uh, you know a, a good safety and, and, and efficacy, uh, sometimes you can bypass that. If you have a huge experience with this, why not? So I, I, I think it's very hard to generalize. Uh, it also depends, of course, on the individual lesion itself. 
uh, as, as you know, if it's a lesion that's, you know, it's so obviously a malignant lesion, nowadays, you know, there's no point in wasting too much time getting a preoperative diagnosis. Uh, I, we, we just go straight to surgery. So again, I, I go back to that point. MDT management is hugely is essential. I think the MDT sits together to determine whether or not a lesion needs a preoperative biopsy or whether you go straight to surgery. And if you do need a biopsy, it depends on the MDT experience. Okay, who's got a high success rate using which technique to get the biopsy? Let me just come in with a comment on this situation. Uh, uh, Alan, you have very rightly said that at this moment of time, the literature is suggesting that a sub-lobar resection is far, far superior than any other modality out there, including SBRT. But entering the world of endobronchial uh, you know, technology, we are now entering into electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. And not just diagnostic EMN, but we are now entering into a world of therapeutic EMN. And, mm. and uh, you know, uh, Kelvin Lau, as you know him well, he has done about seven or eight cases of EMN guided uh, microwave ablation of these tumors. And so I think uh, we, though we may shout from the top of the roofs that we still have a job as surgeons, things may change uh, pretty fast uh, down the road. And, uh, you know, particularly with the endobronchial world coming in, uh, I am I am concerned that we may no longer uh, have a job as surgeons, but probably as endoscopists. And so it's important that we keep that domain in under our care rather than let the pulmonologist take over the EMN and the EVAS. Absolutely, I couldn't yeah. agree more. I think we need to keep an open mind, but at the same time, as I said, I think from what we do know, we need to stand our ground as well. Yes, we we yes, we do. Yes, we absolutely. Do. I'm not saying we should stop operating. I'm just sort of, it's for these youngsters to know that things are changing. And next year, Alan might be giving a completely uh, different take on the same talk. <laughs> so, okay. you know <laughs> All right, next question, please. Who, who wants to come up with the question? Sir, I have one more question, sorry. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, what is the uh, amount of margin you need to give, if you, especially if you are thinking in terms of wide resection, other than if you are not uh, planning for a segmentectomy? Excellent question. I'm very glad you brought that up. Now, um, uh, to be very technical, uh, I don't think there really is enough evidence to say a specific magic number. I think uh, most people go by one of two things. Either they say one centimeter, but it's purely arbitrary, you know, one centimeter margin. Why? I don't know. I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence. Another thing people go by is, uh, is the diameter of the lesion itself. So, you know, the margin should be at least the diameter of the, of the lesion that you're taking out, if not twice the diameter. But again, these are all very arbitrary numbers. I, I don't, uh, I haven't seen any conclusive evidence yet uh, saying that. But as a rule of thumb, I think these two are, you know, fairly reasonable. And uh, to be honest, the, uh, all the results that I've showed you so far were done well, more or less, not strictly, but more or less according to, the, to these uh, 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 rules of thumb. Well, just, and uh, is, is, yeah, is yeah. there any uh, uh, difference in uh, doing a bite dissection and, uh, or a segmentectomy uh, in terms of taking out the lesion? I mean, uh, obviously in a bite dissection, you will not be able to take out the vein not be able to take care of the vein and the artery separately. So then, uh, how, uh, how do you how do you take care of the margins there? How do you take care of margins? Um, well, I think that is where I was saying earlier that uh, personally, my own preference is for good preoperative uh, uh, CT, 3D CT uh, uh, marking or identification. So we actually uh, use the DICOM data. We use uh, 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 3D reconstruction, we can actually see where the intersegmental planes are, we see where the lesion is, and we can actually see um, uh, how, what, what the distance is between the two. And so if I know that there's an adequate margin on a pre op CT, I know if I do that at the segment I can I will necessarily get the margins I want. With uh, doing, if, you, if you're not uh, that experienced with segmentectomies and you want to do a wedge, 
uh, traditionally, again, it's done by palpation. You, you put in a stapler, you don't fire it yet, but you just feel, do I have enough margin? It's not that accurate, but it usually does the trick. Um, there are ways of doing it better. Uh, uh, Indesign in green, as I mentioned, is, uh, is, is one way to do it. You can use uh, different preoperative localization techniques. Uh, I, th I think I've heard from my friends in Europe when they put in uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the fluid to make it palpable, that usually works quite well. So I think it really depends on, on again, on the individual center, which you have most experience with. Personally, I use the, the preoperative uh, mapping. Just uh, another technical question for the students is how do you uh, define the margin of the segment, which means do you reinflate the segment or do you reinflate the whole lung? What do you do? Well, uh, which is the better way to do it? And uh, what are the... Well, that, that, that is a whole different topic. Okay. So um, as, as you, there are different ways of doing it. Again, from the textbooks, the, the most... Uh, caveman way of doing it is to follow the venous anatomy. So traditionally, if you do open surgery, you go uh, uh, low bar level pulmonary vein, dissect it distally until you get a segmental pulmonary vein. And if you identify this, the, the, uh, the, the pulmonary veins as they go into segmental levels, they define the intersegmental plane for you. In VATS, the VATS era, this is very difficult. So most of us would use inflation deflation. So you uh, do the artery, you do maybe the vein, but you, and you do the bronchus. And uh, once you dissected the bronchus, you have two options. So, um, uh, so either you um, uh, staple off the bronchus uh, and, and, then, uh, and then you um, put a little needle into the distal bronchus stump and inflate air into it so it expands the target segment. Or you, you clamp the... Um, uh, the uh, segmental uh, level bronchus, asinesis to inflate the lung so that the target uh, segment is not inflated and that will define your plane for you. Now, there are arguments pro and cons for each. The people say you should inflate the target segment, say that if you, if you do the uh, uh, deflated target segment technique, uh, because the, the, the target segment is deflated, the volume shrinks, so there is a chance that you're not taking enough segment out. So they do the inflation of the target segment. The problem with that is if you stick a needle into that target segment and you pump air into it, there have been reports that you're pumping air into the circulation and you get air embolism. I can so, watch for that one. I can watch for that one. Yes, it happened. First time I saw this technique in Japan and I came back to the UK uh, in Southampton and I got in a butterfly and you know clamped and put the butterfly into the distal bronchus and then asked the anesthetist to use the jet encephalator to just inflate that bronchus and the next thing I knew the blood pressure was 20 and the chest was open and we were touching the heart and tilt the table and <laughs> the bypass machine because what had happened was that because it was a collapsed uh, bronchus, distal bronchus, the needle had gone through and through the bronchus, through the two walls of the bronchus into oh, no. the artery behind and we were merrily uh, encephalating with a jet encephalator into the heart, uh, a huge volume of air. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we managed to save the patient, but uh, I promise you, it's not a pleasant experience. Ooh, scary. I, I don't just, do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's safe to say. I'll just mention two other techniques, just for a complete mistake for the audience out there. Uh, one, one other technique that uh, I, I've seen some people do is um, they actually preoperatively, when they do the bronchoscopy, they go to the target segment they actually inject methylene blue into that target segment and then they put a balloon to lock the methylene blue in the target segment so that when you go in, the methylene blue will just highlight your target segment. That's one way of doing it. The most modern way of doing it, of course, is again in the sign in green, as you know. So you, you staple off the uh, segmental pulmonary artery and then when it comes to defining the planes, you give the in the sign in green systemically and uh, the part, the target segment, because you don't have any circulation there, will not light up. All the normal non-target segments will light up. So that's the more modern way of doing well, it. 
uh, in my center, there are two surgeons who are doing this work on the robotic platform. Okay. And one of them gives it IV, and one of them gives it endobronchially preoperatively. So just like it, methylene blue, they give the, uh, Sasha and David are both trying out these techniques. And so one of them gives it endobronchially into the segment. And the other one is giving it uh, IV, and uh, you know we're doing a comparative <laughs> study to see which is better. Okay. We don't know the answers yet. I don't think there will be that. Sir. Yeah, I don't think there'll be answer, but it's it's an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Next question, please. Who wants to come up with the next question? Pallavi, Pallavi, uh, uh, let me unmute your microphone, or you unmute it and. Ask the question. Go ahead, Pallavi. You're on the floor. Uh, sir, oh. I have two questions. Yes. Please. Uh, so, uh, one question is, sir, uh, just as we're saying that uh, wedge resection, if we can get good margins, is good enough. So, are we then looking at the fact that if uh, the tumor is closer to the intersegmental plane, instead of going for an apical posterior segmentectomy, we'll go for a wedge resection? Um, I, I think what, what our, uh, my, my point just now was that we, we don't know if uh, wedge resection with an adequate margin is equivalent to a segmentectomy. I, I think uh, there's a suspicion that it might be, but right now I don't think we have the evidence yet to, to prove that point. All we can, all the evidence that we do have at the moment still says segmentectomy is superior. So at the moment, I think if you can do a segmentectomy, it's probably better. Maybe in future we'll have more evidence to, to, to point the way. Uh, and sir, uh, is there any trial which is looking at, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we are always saying segmentectomy in high risk patients of stage 1A. Are we looking at any future trials which are coming up saying that it's all patients where we're comparing a segmentectomy versus a lobectomy in non high risk patients as well? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think all the upcoming uh, major trials uh, looking at sublobar section are still specifically looking at the smaller lesions. So if you look at the, within Japan, within Japanese society, they've actually very neatly split up all their lung cancers uh, into different trials, okay, uh, 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 depending on the size and, and the clinical stage of these lesions. And it's only the small uh, lesions, the early stage and uh, N0 small lesions that are going into the randomized trial uh, uh, for subliminal resections. Anything bigger than that, I don't. I automatically are shifted into different trials. So at the moment, I don't think uh, there is a trial to address what you just said. Uh, sir, the point being that uh, high risk to undergo a lobectomy is what uh, uh, are we comparing that? Um, oh, good, good point. Yeah, I think for these compromised patients, uh, I don't think there. Are, I'm not aware of any uh, major uh, prospective trials uh, on uh, on the way. What we do know is that for these compromised patients, I think the existing evidence is already good enough that the guidelines already said, yeah, if you can't do a lobectomy for any stage one patient, go ahead and do a, a subobar section. I think the guidelines have already reached that stage. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, next question. Who wants to ask the next question? Any more questions coming, especially from the exam? Sir, <coughs> sir Amol, sir. Amol, yeah. Amol. Yes, sir. Put your oh. video. Uh, Amol, switch your video on. Hi, Amol. Yes, sir. What? Okay. Your video. We need to see. Hello, sir. Good. Ah, oh, good to see yes. you. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, uh, what are the situations where uh, uh, we consider converting a segmentectomy into the higher resections like lobectomy? Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, what are the situations where we uh, think that segmentectomy is not possible in this patient after opening the uh, ch chest or uh, uh, through the vats? Very good point. Uh, very good question. I, th I think there are several things that immediately come to mind. One, of, of course, is uh, a technical or surgeon-specific surgeon reasons. If your skill or experience doesn't allow you to complete the segmentectomy, it doesn't hurt to do a lobectomy. The other thing, of course, is, is the margins. Uh, so I, th I think... Um, uh, intraoperatively, you think you can uh, do good margin, but you still have to assess it intraoperatively. You still have to feel it, even if you take the lesion out. Uh, you, you, uh, we, we make it a point of cutting open every every segment that we resect to, to have look at the margins. If it's not enough, then you should do the uh, uh, extended resection. The last uh, consideration, uh, which again is a is a is a is a debatable point, is the status of the N1 lymph nodes. A lot of people uh, talk about if you're doing a segmentectomy, 
then as part of the uh, segmental level dissection, you're going to encounter a lot of N1 lymph nodes, so stations 12, 13, 14. <coughs> if you see these, uh, uh, many surgeons recommend you should take them for frozen section. And if you see N1 lymph node metastasis, then you should uh, <coughs> convert to a lobectomy. I think it's a very valid point, uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, theoretically it's sound, but the, the evidence is still, uh, in terms of survival evidence, I haven't seen much of that. One, one important point in this, uh, in this question is anatomical variations. If you've got abnormal anatomy, which on table you cannot make out, you know, you're not sure where, which one is going to which segment. And believe me, there is a lot of abnormal anatomy that you come across, particularly when you get into the segmental and the subsegmental uh, uh, resection. Then it's better to do a lobectomy than to leave behind a small segment which is poorly vascularized or, uh, you know, poorly drained. That is the worst thing you could do to the patient because that will give you post-operative atelectasis. You might get gangrene and you might get all these other complications, particularly when you're doing a tri-segmentectomy and trying to leave one segment behind like the lingula or, you know, in the right lower lobe, you're trying to do more than one segment. So abnormal anatomy is always an indication to do a lobectomy. If you think that segment left behind is going to be compromised, don't leave it behind. Take it out. It's okay. Excellent point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And next question, please. Uh, so Alan, we're, really, we're really pushing you hard, but... No uh, worries. I, I enjoy this conversation. Your, your patience with us. Okay, who's next? Pallavi, tell us. Sir, just one more thing. Based on this uh, current discussion, suppose we have taken the patient for a sublobar resection because he's unfit for a lobectomy, and then there's an anatomical variation. What then? Then you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think uh, if, if worse comes to worse and you can't do a lobectomy, then I would, uh, I don't know, I, I'd probably just try and get away with a, 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 a wide wedge resection as much as yeah, I can. That is the answer. Then, uh, and then just trust in adjuvant therapy, I guess. That's <laughs> not a very satisfying answer, but that's probably... Period. Yeah. So pray hard that night that... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the remaining segment doesn't go gang. And, and question, I yeah. promise you, there are many, many nights I've spent sleepless nights thinking, <laughs> what is the X-ray going to be like tomorrow morning? So you're in trouble if that's the situation. Yeah. Wedge is the answer to that. Okay, next. Who wants to ask the next question, please? That's it. We, are, we, are we all done? All questions asked? Vinita and Andre. Any pressing questions you want for the FRCS exam? <coughs> uh, Pallavi is back on. Okay, so just, just to sum up the discussion, uh, I think uh, this has been a fantastic talk about sublobar resection. It's a very, very difficult uh, subject. And we, we, we really need to understand the philosophy behind why you do sublobar resections. We need to understand all the... Sorry, Amol has raised his hand. Amol, did you want to ask a question? Go yeah, ahead. Hi, hi, sir. Hi. Who is that? Amol. Amol. Hi. Which are, ah, my friend Amol. How are you? <laughs> hi, Dr. Allen. Hi. Hi, sir. Hi. Oh, good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, same here. I would say excellent talk and great, great discussion so far. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, Amol. <laughs> yeah. no, so, I think, uh, I, actually, I had a question as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, 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 this was this was actually a recent case scenario where uh, this patient was treated for RCC and uh, had a, a lesion in the uh, right lower lobe, 1.3 centimeters uh, on on CT. And uh, considering it as a med, just a wedge resection was done, mm -hmm. and uh, frozen did not uh, dif could not differentiate between. Uh, met and uh, se uh, a second primary, but the final histopath came up as a primary adenocarcinoma. Mm. So, in such cases, was <coughs> would it be possible to do something like a completion segmentectomy, or uh, you would uh, choose a lobectomy over a completion segmentectomy? So, th this is a uh, confirmed invasive adenocarcinoma. Yes, sir. Okay, primary and it's uh, early stage. 
I think if I was going to go in again, uh, I, I would just do a completion lobectomy. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, in this kind of scenario, if you've got a good enough wedge resection, I mean, just doing a so-called completion segmentectomy, one, it's technically impossible to do. Yeah. Two, even if you can do it, I don't think it, uh, there's any reason to believe that it's going to give any better results. Whereas, you know, if it's an invasive carcinoma and the patient can tolerate it, uh, uh, either you, you, you forget surgery and give adjuvant therapy, or if you're going to go in, you might as well take the low belt. Right. I, I think you're sure. right. I, I think technically to go in uh, and try and do a segmentectomy where there are already two large staple lines is going to be absolutely impossible, Amol. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think right. you, <laughs> the best of the segmentectomy surgeons would struggle with that. So in that scenario, okay. I think doing a lobectomy is the correct answer. And I, I have really never come across in literature somebody present a paper or write an article of completion segmentectomy. segmentectomy. Most people have written about completion lobectomy or completion pneumonectomy. pneumonectomy. Yeah, but completion segmentectomy, maybe we should do it all. who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it will be technically very challenging. Very challenging. So excellent, excellent discussion. I'm really feeling so pleased with this discussion. Any more questions people want to ask? Otherwise, I've got to let Alan go. It's really very, very late in Hong Kong, but I appreciate his, uh, his commitment to teaching. And one of the things that I want everybody to sort of, you know, it, it's really a success of the internet and the electronic media that, you know, I am sitting here in my suit Alan is sitting in his pajamas and Amol is lying down on his bed uh, listening to this conversation. And, and really, this is the way education has to happen. Alan, for us as ATEP board members, I think we've got to take this step further, uh, take this further as in, you know, reach out to people in their own homes, in their own comfort zone, and then teach. And then I feel that the reception is much better than people coming to meetings and, you know, trying to attend uh, lectures because there they can't ask you the questions on a one-to-one -one basis as we discussed today. Uh, so thank you very much, Alan, and thank you, everybody. I think I'm going to call it a day and I'm going to uh, end the meeting. And also thank you to James. I think James is online. I did see him online. And uh, James is from View Medi and he's listening in, trying to understand how we can reach out to a wider audience uh, through these lectures. And this lecture will come online uh, in the next hour or so. I've got one more meeting to go to. So let me finish the meeting and then hopefully tonight I'll try and uh, finish the editing of, not the editing, but it has to be processed and I'll put it up on you. Again, thank you very much, Alan. Alan, do we have you available for another lecture next week? I believe. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Something completely yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have to actually uh, volunteer for another one. So thank you very much, and we, we'll talk to each other, and t I'll, I'll try and get that uh, lecture up there. Again, thank you very much, Alan. Really, really appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, Good. everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, certify okay. me. Yes, oh, yes, we've got one last one from <laughs> <laughs> For you, Flavia. No problem. Oh, yeah, yeah. For all. Go on. Yes, sir. Uh, just one thing, uh, SBRT versus surgery is something that, uh, I mean, even in India, I've attended too many conferences. And every time, we never have a consensus in the sense that we attend the radiology side, they always support SBRT, we always support surgery. So are we any closer to getting a consensus ever on this? Yeah, it's, it's going to be so hard. I mean, if you argue on the evidence, as you know, you can always pull clinical data to support any viewpoint on earth. Uh, I, I, th I think um, the only way you can do it, I mean, rather, rather than um, debating on a theoretical basis at a conference, it's actually much more um, uh, constructive really to be at the individual patient level in your own MBT. So rather than, you know, arguing, you know, at, at a conference in general in theory with these radiologists, I mean, or these radiotherapists, they're never going to believe you anyway. So uh, forget it. <laughs> But back in your own hospital, in the surroundings of your own MDT, then I think uh, hopefully what we've given you today is a bit more ammunition to stand your ground. That uh, SBRT uh, uh, has its disadvantages. Uh, surgery definitely has its strengths. And if you stand your ground and you have a fair, open-minded uh, discussion with your uh, uh, 
MDT colleagues, well, who knows what the conclusion might be on a patient-to-patient -patient basis. But I think we need to keep an open mind, yet we need to arm ourselves with the evidence. Yeah. Absolutely. Pallavi, Thank you. one thing that you've got to understand is a lot of this is driven by private practice. And, uh, you know, each one of us sees a patient and then we want the income from the medical things. So the only way out of this is to ensure that every single patient that you operate on, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's in the government hospital, or whether it's in a private <coughs> it has to go through an MDT, multidisciplinary team meeting, and everybody's got to agree. So there should be no cancer in any hospital in any part of the world, which should actually go forward for a treatment without an MDT consensus. And that's the only way we will be able to change things. Okay? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everybody, and good night, and uh, hopefully see you next time. My voice is back, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Alan. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everybody.